The National Security Archive at George Washington University has posted a document obtained via the Freedom of Information Act that finally officially acknowledges the existence of Area 51. The document is a CIA report on overhead reconnaissance and details the history of the development of the U-2 and Oxcart spy planes from 1954 to 1974, both of which were developed and tested at the super-secret Area 51 airstrip on the Nevada Test and Training Range adjacent to Nellis Air Force Base. To get some perspective on this story, we got in touch with John Greenwald from TheBlackVault.com. He is a Freedom of Information Act expert and has amassed a large amount of declassified documents. All right, we've got John Greenwald here, and you're an expert in FOIA. You've got TheBlackVault.com, which has probably the largest uh, archive of declassified government documents. So thank you for joining us. Absolutely. So the, there's a big news about declassification of Area 51. What's going on? Well, today a document was put online by the National Security Archive. It's a private organization based out of George Washington University. And they do what I do. They file FOIA requests and under the Freedom of Information Act ask the government for certain uh, types of documents. They do an amazing job and they have a, a great archive online, again, hosted by George Washington University. Now, that being said, they were able to get the CIA to re-review a document that they had classified uh, quite a few years ago and, and uh, released, and had them unredact quite a few things. And in that process, the National Security Archive was able to get a very detailed description about the genesis of what we know as Area 51 something that's been theorized and speculated a lot, but never really have we had such a detailed account of Area 51. Now, the media has obviously uh, kind of glommed onto this today. It's all over the place, uh, which is a very good thing because it brings attention to the government secrets that they can hold and can hold for quite some time. But they're advertising as the first time that the government has acknowledged Area 51 exists. And I kind of get a kick out of these inaccuracies in, in the reporting of major media outlets, not to throw any under the bus, but I think that uh, it really kind of goes to show you how they cover a lot of topics. Uh, I was just on with George Norrie on Coast to Coast just last Friday, and we were talking about how the media will kind of latch onto a story, but it doesn't matter if it's accurate or not. And, that's, and we profiled one of them last week, and, and almost across the board, they were completely inaccurate. Now, this one wasn't as bad, but I think that uh, quite a few documents uh, were overlooked, uh, two in particular that I got declassified uh, way back in 2001, and it was the first acknowledgement that I know of of true Area 51's existence. Now, that was not mentioned, and I'm not sure why. I don't know if they just kind of don't do their due diligence or if they aren't interested in kind of the facts, they just want to profile one particular thing, whatever the case may be. But it's hitting the mainstream media pretty hard today, and, and it's, it's an amazing story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, to your point, um, and we've talked about this a lot in our interviews and on the shows, uh, about the due diligence doesn't seem to be necessary when it comes to UFOs. Uh, an example I think you'd be very familiar with was the FBI vault, and when they released uh, a bunch of files, there were some UFO files in there, and the media talked about, oh, this is the first time these documents had been out, when that wasn't the case at all. They'd been out for decades. That's true, yeah. And what happens with the media is they use certain buzzwords or what's trending or what's popular, what's viral, and they kind of go on to that. And I think that that's an unfortunate thing in most cases when it comes to the field of ufology because a lot of the viral videos or what you would call you know, viral or trending, whichever term you want to use, a lot of them are really on, uh, more on the fabricated or hoax side. For example, the Haiti video, the UFO over Haiti, where you know you had multiple UFOs uh, seen flying around, and you hear the the cameraman gasp, and and it was an amazing video on its cover, and it was being touted as real. And of course, uh, material like that is what hits the media, not the real stuff. Of course, we know that that was a hoax, and most seasoned UFO investigators look at that and go, "Wait a minute here." That's just a little too bit, too good to be true. And I think that that's an unfortunate thing with the media is they're profiling the wrong thing. And going back to Area 51, it's amazing material that they're profiling. But you know what? Evidence has been around 
that has shown and proven <clears throat> that, that Area 51 exists. And yet, why did they ignore that or not care? And then all of a sudden they care. You know, is somebody coming out with a book? Is there a new sci-fi movie coming out at the end of the summer? You know, th there's always kind of a tie-in to something. And I, and I think that that is a little bit unfortunate because there is evidence that presents itself, uh, not only with government conspiracies and secrets that really shows what their capabilities truly are, but even the UFO phenomena as a whole. There's a lot of amazing evidence and pieces of information that come out, but we don't hear about 99.8% of it. And the 0.2% that we do hear about, you go, come on, that happened a year ago. <clears throat> we know it's a hoax. We know there's nothing to it or something to that effect, and, and it's unfortunate that they profile the wrong thing. Case in point, the Phoenix Lights, amazing case, not a hoax, but how long did it take for the major mainstream media to catch on to that? You know, and then when we should have gotten more witnesses, should have gotten more investigations out there, kind of that ship had already sailed, um, and, and so I think that they kind of missed the ball to where, what would ufology be like if media reported the good stuff, and reported it in a timely manner. Just those two things, and, and obviously kept accurate. I think the field of ufology would get a different name. I, I think the stereotypes would go away. I think you'd have more people involved, and I think you would have a much higher percentage of the general public that would take this very seriously. And speaking of the good information, and to give credit where credit's due, and, <clears throat> and exemplify why it's important what you do, you had mentioned you had obtained two documents that explicitly had uh, mentioned Area 51 prior. Could you tell us about those documents? Absolutely. Under the Freedom of Information Act, back in 2001, I obtained a single-page document from the Department of Energy that detailed an installation known as Area 51 that the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, later as we know, the Department of Energy, had owned and operated. Now, just through speculation and also historical fact, we know that uh, in the budding days of the Department of Energy and the Atomic Energy Commission, they were responsible for uh, detonating our nation's nuclear arsenal. They were the ones that were testing a lot of the biggest and most deadly weapons that we've ever created. And they did so uh, in quite a few different areas, but namely a top secret installation, as they said, known as Area 51 part of the Groom Lake installation, also attached to Nellis Air Force Base. And we know that because the Department of Energy actually declassified and admitted it. So this, from what I understand, is one of the first actual admissions to a base, again, known as Area 51, not to be mistaken with the one that was acknowledged, at, uh, an installation at Groom Lake, or maybe a, an extension of Nellis Air Force Base. This was Area 51, it said it in black and white. The document also said, and, and it was a very short document, it doesn't take long to read, it's about three or four paragraphs, but at the end it said that the Department of Energy turned over the installation, again known as Area 51, to the Department of Defense for their use and for their testing and for their experiments. So again, it really kind of went into a little detail about what the government was doing out there and how they were handling that particular installation. A couple of years later, I was able to obtain also from the National Reconnaissance Office, or the NRO, a one-page uh, declassified document that also referenced Area 51. But to me, this was a fascinating document just simply because of the history behind it. And what they did was to test our reconnaissance capabilities and the technology uh, of the U-2 that was on board of the U-2 reconnaissance aircraft they created a, a flyover of Area 51. Now, this was in the 60s, so Area 51 had been around since we believe about 1955. And so the base was in operation. And so they took a U-2 and flew it over the Groom Lake installation or in, in Area 51 specifically, as they mentioned, and wanted to see exactly what they could see. What could the analysts deduce by the photos that were taken from the U-2 spy craft? over Area 51. And I never got any other documents about how capable that U-2 was, and my guess is a lot of that is still gonna be classified. But I think that it was very interesting because as a test, we were spying on ourselves, so to speak, and we were creating a scenario uh, very similar to when we would fly over the Soviet Union 
or when we would fly over China or wherever else. And, and we wanted to see what we were capable of doing. This is the second document that I know that's been around that, again, acknowledged Area 51, its location, and obviously some heavily guarded secrets going on there. Mm -hmm. What is the significance of what uh, this document being released and uh, the Area 51 material no longer being redacted? Uh, is that significant when it comes to FOIA requests? I think it's significant because we have a broader and clearer picture about the genesis of Area 51, how and why it started. I think it's also important to the Freedom of Information Act because to somebody like me, I've done this for 17 years now. August is actually my 17th birthday, so to speak, of, of the Black Vault. And after doing it for 17 years, you see quite a bit of ridicule to the law. And you know what? There is a lot to be ridiculed. However, on a positive note, the process works. I've got 710,000 pages uh, to show that it works, that you can get information declassified. Kudos to the National Security Archive because this document was released before. But what they accomplished was to get the CIA to re-review this document, to go back and declassify more of it. And that shows that although it takes a lot of work, takes a lot of patience, uh, you're going to be frustrated quite a bit along the way, and also it's going to take some dollar signs, you can accomplish quite a bit with the Freedom of Information Act. And I think it's encouraging for somebody like me, and I always want to push that encouragement to the public who maybe has never even heard of the Freedom of Information Act or has never filed a request before to use it or to pay attention because as the, the public pushes more and more for information, as the public, I guess you can say the term, wakes up a little bit about the inner workings of the government, whether it be about UFOs, top secret technology, or some of the many scandals that we're hearing about quite a bit nowadays, I think when you, when you look at that and then you, you look at what just came out, even though it was, quote unquote, just about Area 51, it shows that the government can, will, and eventually will declassify secrets for us to look at. And I think that that is one of the prime reasons that I do what I do, because they'll deny something in 2005, but in 2013, they may release it. So you can never give up, and this is a prime example of why. So uh, besides kind of some of the things you had mentioned, are there also uh, other benefits for the UFO field in general beyond? Uh, is there hope that maybe we'll find out more about Area 51? I think the fact that Area 51 and, and kind of the details to its genesis now being declassified could be a little bit encouraging to the UFO uh, investigators and researchers in the world simply by the fact that they're starting to open up more of their secrets. We have a better understanding of what might be going on in Area 51. But here's what we don't have. We don't have that acknowledgement that UFOs as pop culture slash historical uh, speculation has kind of given us that they're involved in some type of extraterrestrial connected technology. That's what we don't have yet. But I think that as the years progress and more and more gets declassified, who knows, maybe something will come to light that will shed a little bit more evidence uh, from, from the secret holdings of the government that allows someone like Bob Lazar to have a little bit more credence. I'm not saying an opinion on Bob Lazar's story either way, but I think what is key is we just have to take his word for it. We don't have the acknowledgement that, that those types of experiments or operations are underway at Area 51. 10, 12, 15 years ago, we really didn't have any acknowledgement of Area 51, none whatsoever. And then again, as the years progress, documents come out, um, as you can see on theblackvault.com, one page at a time. But now, here we are, uh, I guess it would be about 12 years later, and the National Security Archive gets hundreds of pages, a lot of which detail more of the genesis of Area 51. So it kind of shows that it does take time, but eventually these secrets do come out and do shed a little bit of light on some of the darker secrets that may never officially be acknowledged, but it does lend a lot more credence to them being real. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Bob Lazar, and he said he had worked on back-engineered extraterrestrial spacecraft at Area 51, and in particular an area called S-4. And now none of these documents that I'm aware of have an official mention of S-4, is that correct? That's correct. I've never seen an official S-4 document. It's mostly just mentioned specifically Area 51. But as we know with Area 51, who knows, maybe 2025, 
my kid will learn that I just obtained a document that acknowledges S4, and of course it opens up a whole new realm of possibility. Okay, all right, great. And all of these documents you mentioned, people can go find at theblackvault.com. Yeah, everything is available on theblackvault.com, and as we speak on the front page is the direct link to the Area 51 section, and you can download the two pages that I reference, but also the declassified document that the National Security Archive uh, was able to obtain. All right, great. Thank you so much for joining us. We also spoke with Alan Palmer, the Executive Director and CEO of the National Atomic Testing Museum in Las Vegas. They are currently featuring an exhibit on Area 51 that includes the UFO and alien rumors. They also have been hosting a UFO lecture series with some very credible speakers that we featured on Open Minds. And you all have an Area 51 exhibit. Well, we do, uh, and it's the only one that I know of in the country. Uh-huh, and you started that exhibit uh, how long ago? Well, it's about a year and a half ago. We opened the end of March of 2012. Mm -hmm. So it's been going strong since then, and I've just decided we were going to take it down the end of this year because it's a temporary exhibit, uh, and that's designed to get people into the museum and have something that rotates. It's been so successful that I've decided to extend it. Great. And you put it up before the base was acknowledged, even though, of course, in pop culture, it's very popular. Well, we, we did. Uh, and Alejandro, as, as you may remember, because I know you were out here, we, we, just, we originally were going to do this about three or four years ago. Uh, and at the time, it seemed like a good idea, but uh, we were concerned about the classification of a lot of it. And we didn't have access to the people being able to talk about their experiences because they were still under oath. So we decided it wasn't time then, so we kind of tabled it. We did bring it back, you know, a year and a half ago when some of this was then declassified by the CIA and the Air Force. Mm -hmm. So did you eventually run into any problems where the Air Force saying, hey, you know, were they, did they tell you they were uncomfortable uh, with it since it wasn't acknowledged at that point at all? No, not at all. But uh, about a year ago, uh, the CIA historian uh, came out here for a lecture. He gave a lecture about Area 51 and the Roadrunners over at the University of uh, Nevada, Las Vegas, right on our campus here, and, uh, and was over here, too, saying pretty much the same thing. That was about a year ago. Mm -hmm. And um, what made you decide to, to start the Area 51 exhibit? Well, it's a fascinating subject, but the, and, and there's a lot that centers around UFOs and aliens, but I have to tell you, the really true story about what was done out there now that it's been declassified is just about as fascinating as anything you can make up about aliens and UFOs. <laughs> now, when it comes to Area 51, a lot of people ask, you know, they're, they're confused. They're like, well, how can it not be acknowledged if we know about it? Did you get that question, and, and how did you answer that? Yeah, well, there's been a lot of uh, deep secrecy about Area 51 for a very good reason. Uh, and it goes back to the purpose of it when it was developed back in the, the mid-1950s. Uh, during that period, we were in the, in the height of nuclear weapons testing. And this was before satellites. So there was no way for us to kind of literally peek over the fence to see what the Soviets were doing in their country, didn't have satellites, and there's a huge, vast geographical separation in uh, where their test site was in uh, the old uh, Soviet Union. So we had to develop a way to do that. That was the U-2 and later the uh, A-12 uh, SR-71. Now, with the release of the CIA documents, it's kind of like an acknowledgement now that Area 51 exists and the kind of work you just mentioned was done there. Does that change things for, for you? How has this been for you in, in your exhibit? No, it really doesn't change anything because, frankly, the word was out about three years ago. Uh, so it's not news to us. Uh, I know it's news uh, certainly within the Washington bubble and maybe internationally, because not everybody may have picked up on it. But there were actually documents from the CIA and the Air Force which declassified the name and the whole concept of what was out there a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. 
So why do you think the media is picking up on it today and they didn't a couple years ago? Because I don't think it was out very widely. And apparently what has been picked up now are some written references in CIA summaries. Uh, and that, that certainly may be new. But the, but the admission by both CIA and the Air Force that uh, the program existed uh, is not terribly new. Mm -hmm. Have you been getting a lot of interviews today from the media inquiring about Area 51? Yeah, actually starting yesterday, as soon as this broke, we got a, we got a call because it came out on NBC. But we got a call from a local NBC affiliate who hurried right down to talk about it. Uh, and it's been several TV stations today and uh, interviews, and uh, so it's become kind of hot and heavy. Now, you're out there in Las Vegas, and uh, you've had George Knapp there speaking at uh, the museum, and he's pretty much kind of the guy who broke the whole Area 51 story, uh, at least made it really popular in the part with the ETs and extraterrestrials. Yep. Is, is the media kind of more sensitive to this topic out in Las Vegas than you think the general population? You know, I don't think so. Uh, even though it happened here, there is tremendous interest, and particularly uh, in Southern California, uh, people come here a lot to, to learn more about it. Uh, but even even in Europe, it's been a very strong thing there. Have you been surprised at all by the uh, number of people interested in your exhibit and coming out and interested in the topic of Area 51? Well, actually, I have been. And I, what I'm surprised at is the, the breadth and the depth of the interest. Uh, apparently, it's quite popular in South America and extremely popular in places like Ireland, which I was a little bit surprised to learn about. Mm -hmm. um, and then you all are associated with the Smithsonian, is that correct? We are. We're a Smithsonian affiliate. Uh, we, we don't get financial support from them or guidance, but uh, we're affiliated with them so that the Smithsonian has a way to get their artifacts and some of the things that they own out to the general public a little more widely. Gotcha. And has there been some surprise by uh, people that, you know, uh, a, a museum such as yours would have a, an Area 51 exhibit and then also include the UFO and, and ET aspects or rumors? Well, I, I think it is a bit of a surprise to people. and and. Frankly, the, the business of nuclear weapons development, the defense posture of our country in a Cold War, pretty serious business. Uh, and so people who come here expecting that certainly get a large dose of that. But we also wanted them to see maybe a little more whimsical and a little bit more cultural side of the Area 51 story. So that's why we put it together as myth and reality. You know, the real, the real story, again, is, is fascinating and very true. The other side of it that still exists out there has to do with the genre of, of film and books and against uh, conspiracy theories. It's there. We we needed to address it, so we do that in a I think an interesting way. Uh, so it's an experience for people. It's not a display. They have to go through. They're going to absorb a lot of this material. They have to figure out at the end what it's all about. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of fun. I've been through it a couple of times. It's very creative. And like you said, you know, it's an experience rather than just your typical museum kind of uh, visit. So I definitely recommend That's it for people. Uh, well, one, I think they'll have a great time with it when they get here to see it. Yeah, for sure. At the beginning of this, when you put together the exhibit and you included those kind of cultural and, and whimsical aspects, um, did you think there were much veracity to the UFO claims? And now that you've had a lot of uh, guest lectures, some very credible people in this area come speak, has your view changed at all? Well, it, it's changed in this way. Uh, because there are so many different views of, of what's happened, uh, and frankly, there's lots of very easy explanations for lots of things that people see that have been reported as UFOs. There are equally as many things that are not explainable. And some of those have been brushed over for national security reasons, some because they're just too hard to answer, or some of them because it's just not possible to explain. My view is that some of those things now with increased technology and our ability to maybe look at things through some different lenses, it's appropriate to go back and re-examine some of those things again. Because who knows, there may be something in there that we can discover. 
Mm -hmm. Are you open to the possibility that uh, the, the mystery behind the UFOs are, are something um, beyond perhaps even something man-made? Well, I, absolutely. I, I mean, uh, I got to know uh, the one of the original seven astronauts, Wally Shira, quite well. And I asked him one day, I said, so what do you think about the business of UFOs? Because John Glenn reportedly saw some things he couldn't explain. And so I asked Wally about that, and he said, well, I haven't seen anything I can't explain. He says, but I'm waiting, waiting patiently with great anticipation. And I guess that's my view, too, is... I've, I've not seen anything in the years I was flying in the military that I couldn't explain, uh, but I'm, I'm waiting for the opportunity to see something like that that's real. Yeah, I love that statement because it's kind of uh, uh, apropos for this whole field of UFO investigation. We're all waiting patiently with anticipation. With all of the media coming out there to talk to you, um, just curious, what kind of questions are they asking you? Well, one of the, the biggest questions is, why now? Uh, and, and the answer is because some of this has now been declassified and is no longer damaging to national security. And the reason is because if that would have been released back when it was contemporaneous to what they were doing back in the 50s, if, if somebody would have found out what was going on out there, the Russians would have very quickly closed their nuclear testing programs down, concealed them, put them away where we couldn't see them. But they thought because their country was so vast and we couldn't get to it, they could do whatever they wanted with impunity, and they, and they, they did that. Uh, we learned an awful lot by the overflights of the U-2s until Gary Francis Powers was shot down in 1960. Uh, but during that time, and then later when satellites were developed and we could look in and see an awful lot more, but for a period of time, we had the edge because we could see what they were doing. They didn't know we knew how to do that. That's one of the questions that they were asking a lot was, you know, so why, mm -hmm. why were we even doing this out at Area 51? That was the explanation. Gotcha. All right. Well, great. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. I know you're really busy, and uh, it's been wonderful to, to see you again. You bet, Alan. Thanks a lot. See you. While these documents may not have any revelations in regard to UFOs, as Greenwald notes, it may have positive ramifications for future FOIA requests regarding some of the base's still hidden secrets. On OpenMinds.tv, you can also find a story I've written about some of the inaccuracies in the CIA document regarding the U-2 spy plane and UFOs. As always, we will continue to keep you updated on new developments from Area 51. For OpenMinds.tv, this is Alejandro Rojas.